it's all about intuition, I guess, these days. Everything is changing so fast. It's very hard to actually try to predict something. And what we do is an iterative process. We try every time and then we refine. And that's exactly how we look at the field itself. So if we see a company or a specific field where we feel that what they need to do in order to solve the problem they're trying to approach is actually an iterative process where you have a model and you're constantly refining, rebuilding a better model, then this is a great fit for MLOps. If you have enough automation, you can really accelerate the process. Hey, Jared here. One of the things we can count on in the software industry is change. The state of the art changes so fast, in fact, that keeping up can feel like a whole other job on top of your actual job. That's why we created Changelog Weekly. It's our totally free newsletter that we drop in your inbox each and every Sunday. We link to the latest news, the best articles, and the most interesting projects that you should be aware of. We also add a little commentary from us saying why something's important, pointing you to other instances of a trend, or just making a dorky joke to keep it lively. So if you haven't yet, I recommend subscribing to Changelog Weekly and help us help you keep up with the latest. Head to changelog.com slash weekly and sign up today. Again, it's totally free and we never spam you. Yuck. One last time, that's changelog.com slash weekly. Welcome to Practical AI, a weekly podcast making artificial intelligence practical, productive, and accessible to everyone. This is where conversations around AI, machine learning, and data science happen. Join us at practicalai.fm slash community and follow the show on Twitter. We're at Practical AI FM. Thank you to our partners at Fastly for shipping our pods super fast all around the world. Check them out at Fastly.com. Welcome to another episode of Practical AI. This is Daniel Whitenack. I'm a data scientist with SIL International. I'm joined as always by my co-host, Chris Benson, who is a tech strategist at Lockheed Martin. How are you doing, Chris? I am doing well, Daniel. How are you today? Doing well. Yeah, it's been an interesting couple months and lots of new projects kicking off, so keeping busy. But we just came back from a little bit of vacation last week, which was nice. You got to tell everyone where you went now, now that you've actually brought that up. Okay, yeah. yeah, So we drove down to warmer weather. So we live in the Midwest of the United States and drove down to like... Alabama, did some hiking, kind of back up through Mammoth Cave, which I learned is the world's largest cave network system thing. I don't know the proper terms, but yeah, that was fun. So it went underground for a bit. And yeah, it was a, it was a good time. Yeah. And I'm, I'm pretty psyched for a couple of reasons for this show, Chris, because of course, I always enjoy talking with you, but we've also got <laughs> some familiar technology because we had, if, I don't know if you remember a while back, we had an episode, I think at the time it was called Allegro AI, mm-hmm. which is ML Ops. They've since rebranded to ClearML. And we've got Moses Goopman, who is uh, ClearML CEO and co-founder, but we've also got one of their partners, Green Eye, we've got Alon Klein Orbach, who is the CTO and co-founder at Green Eye, which is an agricultural AI company. So this is going to be fun. We're going to talk about agriculture, AI, ML ops, and get to chat with some some old friends as well. So welcome, Alon and Moses. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to revisit ML Ops with ClearML. We had that show previously. And of course, ML Ops is sort of like, even since we had that show, just kind of exploding as a topic that's on people's mind. What has that been like, Moses, in terms of just like this sort of meteoric rise of people caring about ML Ops and how they actually practically do machine learning? So I think that the market really matured in the last two years. I guess it's probably COVID accelerating the process where everyone is working remotely. So you have to have automated processes and you got to log everything because you cannot call your colleagues every uh, minute or so. And I think that the problems that we kind of discussed in theory two years ago became 
very day-to-day practical problems that companies and individuals run into on a, on a daily basis. And now it's become a problem that it's if, if before it was it was nice to have, now it became like a must for most companies. Back then, only a few understood the benefits and, and kind of the need for, for this um, very uh, comprehensive approach where everything is streamlined. And I think now it's kind of common knowledge, probably not that common to actually implement, but at least the understanding is, is there. Yeah. And Alon, in terms of your, your company, which is sort of like has um, customers who are in the agriculture vertical, but is very much like at its core an AI company from, from my understanding, like how, I, I don't know the full history of, of green eye. So maybe you could give a little bit of that, but did you sort of like do a bunch of AI as green eye and then kind of like come to the ML ops problems or from the beginning, was that something that you kind of needed and was problematic for you? So you kind of started, started with that early on. Hey, it's a, it's a good question. We actually started from different goals or different objective of GreenEye and until we established what this GreenEye is about. So we started uh, hacking about the laptop and training on the GPU on the laptop and stuff like that and really understand there is no scale in it in many, many, many ways. And even add a server there and we needed to install CUDA and CUDA and using no app to keep the script running and really all the best worst practice that you can ever uh, that you can do there's no shame we've we've all been there <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we started with no ml ops at all really no ML ops uh, i think a few years ago my brother one of my uh, them told me hey try docker and i said ah, no 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 and the rest is history. Three years later, today we are completely Dockerized from end to end, Kubernetes all the way, cloud and edge. And this has changed everything because then we realized we can do a lot of ML ops all around and move stuff. So yeah, and maybe just stepping back in terms of Green Eye, I think Chris, I don't know if you remember this, but I forget in what episode it was. I think it was one of our fully connected episodes. We were using the example of like spraying. Yep in crop fields as an example of like this sort of scale between like compute completely human uh, manual process up to like automation and how that's changed. It struck me, Chris, that neither of us are farmers and True. really know much about that process. So uh, Alon, this is very much like the world you live in. So maybe you could just step back and let us know a little bit about like AI and agriculture before we kind of talk about some of the other ML ops things that your company is doing along with ClearML, like what what is AI and agriculture look like generally and how has that developed over time? Sure. So I must be honest, I'm not a farmer as well. I'm from the technical <laughs> side, but I like what we are doing. So in the big image, I think you can divide the, the interest into two, the, the ones that gives tools to help the farmers to get more information and more details about, about uh, the field, the crop, uh, the yield, or anything like that. And you can divide the other group is the tools that make the decision by themselves. So you get a lot of true cool companies uh, like in Israel, uh, Terranis, Prospera, and, uh, other cool that uh, doing a lot of uh, intelligence uh, in the field. They collect the data, they analyze it and show the farmers insight you get drones there, you get satellites there, you get uh, pivots and cameras and, and et cetera. And from the other end, you get decision-making tools that driving the tractors, autonomous sprayers, like the same domains that we are, Blue River and John Deere uh, position that um, was, I think, four years from now. As a follow-up to that, I'm curious, you know, we're so used to on the show kind of talking about these very technical topics and yet, you know, the clientele that your company is serving is one that is getting into technology, as we've as we've talked about. But if you look at the broad history, it hasn't really been something that we associate with high tech and all. What is the merger of something as cutting edge as deep learning ML ops, you know, on one side with farming on the other, you know, where, where that's making this massive transition? What's it like being in that space where you're presumably kind of tying together two very 
very different worlds. We really like it. We are really a very developable company. We have like chemi- uh, chemistry, we have agronomics, we have data science, we have real time, uh, and we have everything from everything cloud and MLOps and, and business sizes, spare operators. And being this spot that everything is connected, the technology is related to the field, is, we really like it. You need to have the business to run and to make sense uh, from a monetized perspective, but it's also nice to do something nice. Yeah, it's nice to apply AI, I'm sure, to a problem that we all have, which is we all need food. (laughs) (laughs) So (laughs) I saw in one of the videos on your site, this sort of like, and this is where my knowledge of all the machinery and, and stuff, but I'm assuming this is like a spraying machine. I don't know if it's specifically for spraying, but it sprays. And then you've kind of got cameras. So I don't know if you could maybe just describe this sort of machine and like the arms of the machine. And like, just so people have a visual of kind of like where your technology fits in. So maybe I I, will start to to understand the problem that we are solving. So imagine you have a garden and you grow vegetable there. And uh, what you do in your free time, you are weeding. You are taking the weed out because they compete with your vegetable about resource, sun, water, and et cetera. And when you are getting bigger, you are starting to use mechanical tools. And when you are getting really big, like farmers in the Midwest, at, uh, Nebraska and uh, Iowa and uh, all of this area, you started to put chemicals because you cannot control the size of farming. You put chemicals and you want to do it fast. So you don't put with a small tractor. You have dedicated sprayer, self propelled sprayer, 66 meter uh, long boom, and you, it's a monster. Yeah, you can walk in underneath the without uh, need to uh, bend under the sprayer. So it's a really big monster that you just drive to do as much as acre as possible in short time. And uh, what we are doing in Green Eye, instead of assuming the worst case scenario that every spot in this in the field has weeds there, so instead of doing that, we are putting sensors, cameras and uh, our computers and uh, nozzles and and everything else we are using to spray only when you need to spray. So instead of putting 100% of chemicals over 5,000 acres field, you are putting 10% for it. And so you're saving uh, money and the world saving chemicals and it's a win-win situation. So about your question, sorry, I I, I forgot. uh, so we have a big sprayer. We have cameras, each like uh, three meters uh, long, and we are just filming the entire boom. We are putting the cameras looking a, a bit ahead, so we have time to process. Everything is done, is done in real time, no connectivity at all to the cloud. So Moses, you know, uh, as I'm listening to Alan talk about his story, and as we're doing this, I'm thinking back to kind of starting with these cutting edge ML ops, when you're looking at the landscape on your side, as someone who's bringing this technology to bear in the marketplace, how are you evaluating different opportunities in industry? I mean, is it just that everything is open? Do you have a way of looking and saying, I see I see an opportunity where this technology in a particular industry is going to be very useful? How, how do you make those kind of judgment calls on how to engage? Good question. So first, it's all about intuition, I guess, these days. Everything is changing so fast. It's very hard to actually try to predict something, if I'm referring back to machine learning. And what we do is an iterative process, and we try every time, and then we refine. And that's exactly how we look at the field itself. So if we see a company or a specific field where we feel that what they need to do in order to solve their problem they're uh, trying to approach is actually an iterative process where you have a model and you're constantly refining, rebuilding a better model, then this is a great fit for MLOps because that basically means that if you have enough automation, you can really accelerate the process. If not, obviously you have to do the same process only manually, which time to market wise really uh, increases the time for you from like the research phase for to actually something that is working where you have some alpha in the middle. And when you see a process where you can say, you know what, with a bit of automation, this model will really work. Like not 90% of the time, which means one out of 10 you fail, which is not like in theory, 90% looks, sounds fine. But in, in practicality, this is not something you can actually sell. 
you think to yourself, okay, the only thing that I need is a bit for uh, more information from the field itself. And then I can just refine the model, rerun it, get a better performance, and then just repeat the process. Then basically I'm golden. I can take it to different scenarios and get my model up and running. And every time we see one of those scenarios, then we, we that's just kind of the moment where we hear the bling, okay, this is a perfect fit for automation for MLOps as kind of a holistic approach. Carlos Zhu, host of Ship It, a show with weekly episodes about getting your best ideas into the world and seeing what happens. We talk about code, ops, infrastructure, and the people that make it happen, like charity majors from Honeycomb. We act like great engineers make great teams, and it's exactly the opposite, in fact. It is great teams that make great engineers. And they farly when the founders of Continuous Delivery. Start off assuming that we're wrong rather than assuming that we're right. Test our ideas, try and falsify our ideas. Those are better ways of doing work. And it doesn't really matter what work it is that you're doing. That stuff just works better. We even experiment on our own open source podcasting platform so that you can see how we implement specific tools and services within changelog.com, what works and what fails. It's like there's a brand new hammer and we grab hold of it and everyone gathers around. We put our hand out and we (laughs) we strike it right on our thumb. And then everybody knows that hammer really hurts when you strike it on your thumb. I'm glad those guys did it. I've learned something (laughs) instead. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting perspective, but I I don't see that way. Okay, it's an amazing analogy, but I'm not sure that applies here. Listen to an episode that seems interesting or helpful. And if you like it, subscribe today. We'd love to have you with us. following up on what what Moses was just talking about with sort of the where the value of ML ops really comes in with automation you gave the the example sort of the concrete example of, of the spraying detecting like places to spray within a within a field with this you know massive machine with that has the the sensors or the cameras on it so like how does the automation or the retraining of models that that you're using, where does that come in? How how often and what sorts of things are you automating in practicality? I think I can spend hours to answer fully of this question, but I must say that the things about MLOps and ML in general, if you compare to understanding a field in the industry like coding, uh, deploying main servers, and etc., there is no best practice yet. The entire industry, everyone invent something on his own and doing something else as we are start getting to some main path but there is no 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 best practice that everyone is agree on so uh, i think from our side uh, we had a lot of challenges we have challenge of data and controlling the data we have a massive amount of data more than millions of images uh, over the field and uh, one of the challenges is getting a model that was trained to the tractor. And before we had any automation, we did, okay, we trained the model and and then we freezed it and we are using TensorRT and uh, Onyx to TensorRT and, and stuff like that. And we did it manually, like each t- step at a time. I think like we got 10 models a year to the tractor. When we got automation, we have thousands of models instructors and rerun and when a researcher finished training there is a click and everything is done automatically is convert is get metrics there to screener mail and what else is done is checking the converting if we didn't uh, miss anything by the converter like performance and we got the 
end of the file there to the tractor by, by a single click. So I think this is one example of, of automation that MLOps really change it. Do I remember correctly that you're also running Kubernetes on the embedded devices? Yes, yes, we're running Kubernetes on the embedded devices. This is completely a game change in our end because well, this is also a conversation different that I can speak so I, hours about it. <laughs> And that's when you say on the embedded devices, we're talking about like on the tractor. On the tractor, yeah, yeah. We have a few devices there and they are running a K3S, is the light version of Kubernetes. It's really nice because we can best practice from the cloud and we get best practice to the edge. And uh, for example, if we want to use clear ML from the edge or from the clouds, it, it doesn't make, uh, really de- make us any different to us. So we know how to press the and move the secrets and how to use it. And we just uh, do it in this sense. Yeah. So you have full visibility to the tractors inside the same dashboard that you're developing in, and you have the entire c- cycle streamlined? So something <laughs> like this. Good, good setup. I like it. <laughs> yeah, there's a rancher, and uh, I can connect any running tractor around the world that is online now and just doing even SSH uh, to to the machine, uh, I can uh, view it all. But this is more bigger one than the MLX and the ML Ops. Uh, This is like, uh, we call it special ops. Special ops, (laughs) I like that. Uh, We actually have dedicated team that's doing research around special ops. So we have uh, ML Ops and uh, DevOps and um, IoT Ops. Now there is FinOps. uh, This is the, the team that moves one step ahead and doing a lot of checks. I try to, to, to find when we started to use the clear mail, I search clear mail, then I understand I need to search Allegro. And I didn't find the right point how we got to know Moses and his guys. So uh, I'm not really sure, but before we, uh, we got to know them, we used Kubeflow pipeline to do the runs and to do the metrics. And we got there to a big wall of complexity. And we shift the training from Kubeflow pipelines to uh, ClearML. I'd like to ask a, a follow-up question about something you were saying a, a moment ago. And it's something kind of close to, to what I'm doing when I'm not podcasting. And, and that is when you talked about having Kubernetes in all the places, in this case on the tractor, and you talked about K3S, can you Tell us a little bit about, I'm a big advocate in Kubernetes in all the places at various scales as a setup. And so since in your use case, you have done that, I'd love to hear how you arrived at that and what benefit you think it's given you. What, you know, why, why do that? Because most people don't think about putting Kubernetes in all the places. They're running kind of in the cloud. They don't have, they're not out on the edge yet the way you are, where you're way out on the edge. And as someone who also in my day job works out on the edge, I'm curious what your thoughts are about how Kubernetes in all the places is a good model going forward. So Chris, you you don't think people, when they think of the ideal deployment target for Kubernetes, they don't think immediately tractor? I'm glad that he does. I'll say that. (laughs) (laughs) Should be right next to it. We are in sprayer world. It's a good question. We started, when we started containers, we started with no Kubernetes and we did like our own deployment system. And we fast, like in months, we, we had the wall of keep them alive, visioning and everything. And then we understand, okay, someone solved this problem. It's no way that, and then we got to Kubernetes on the cloud. And, and at the edge, we still use containers, but with different orchestrator. We had the uh, Azure IoT, if you, if you know it. And uh, we used it for a while. And then we got another wall because Kubernetes is this concept of separation, virtual separation of pods. And this is amazing idea and the other orchestrator didn't edit and we understand okay we need to change and it was not easy because nothing is really ready to arm 64 bit you'd be surprised that most of the libraries maybe today there are some that are more but most of the libraries like one year two years from now no version for arm 24 bits and it was like there is no way that we are on the edge of the edge uh, as a young company. Do you think that NVIDIA having bought ARM recently will have any impact on that? 
Not buying arm. Failing to buy arm. Oh, Failing to buy right. arm. Good yeah. Point. Yeah, I think the regulation issues might uh, affect it. I forgot about that. That's a good point. Yeah, but definitely, I I think will be here for for the edge, and uh, Kubernetes uh, as a um, back to your question help us a lot in, for example, when we have a, a new researcher or a new programmer or whatever, he does not do anything on his laptop. Uh, the laptop is only the gate to the pod that runs or on the tractor or on the, the cloud. And this is the workspace. So if we get to the tractor or in our subject, the, the, the research, a research come to the company, a new research, we just hired a, a new one uh, and she's really good one. And she's got just get, okay, you get access to, we still use Kubeflow for a notebook uh, server. Uh, so we, if she needs a workspace, she just click and get a new notebook and she can use uh, our tool. We use PyCharm for remote interpreter and you just connect to the pods there and you get all the data and you can play from your PyCharm, you can play from your not notebooks. And this is possible. You, you, know, you can get it in different ways, but this is mainly possible. All the games of sharing and forwarding with Kubernetes is much easier. And this is true for the edge and for the for, for the clouds. So no one installing any dependency. I don't know if you play with Java OM or something like that or NPM install or no one installing anything on his computer besides the ID, our philosophy in, in, in general. Everything containerized, no workspace to be installed in any way. And this is really up in specifically in ML environment. So Alan, in terms of like the automation that you're talking about before, you mentioned this sort of information about like thousands, you're able to sort of do more than like thousands of models a year now versus like a sort of order of magnitude lower now that you didn't have automation. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about like for your case, it's, and I'm trying to think of like um, maybe weeds sort of look similar. So like what kind of needs to be updated so much throughout the sort of year for these like vision models or, or whatever models you're running. And then like, could you describe maybe a little bit more, you mentioned kind of bringing in new data, training the model, and then having the pipeline to push it out to the, to the tractor and deciding when and when not to do that. It'd be interesting to hear about the sort of when and when not <laughs> question <laughs> in terms of like what you test within like your ML ops to determine when you push something out and how you, how you do that. Yeah. It's a good question. I will give, start with the, the, the first one uh, about the, the, the models and the numbers models. I think in the end, well, from my experience, uh, I might be wrong, but having a one model to hold them all or something like that, it's not enough. You got the um, vision of uh, YOLO, Retina Net, or any other model, and you need to put more effort to solve a real world problem because you have very a lot of variables, a lot of variance uh, in the real world, uh, and you need to combine classical uh, vision and uh, and deep learning one. So I think in the end, we have metrics on the cloud for the for the models, for the big models on, and so on. But at the end, we want, we want to have metrics on the devices, on the trucks that run themselves. So we keep constantly testing ourselves on the real environment, uh, how we are doing. Also in the terms of performance, not only uh, metrics, performance um, speed-wise, a cycle clock, how fast we can go. Today we can go about six meters uh, uh, per second. You guys speaking uh, mile per hour. So, um, it's about uh, 12, yeah, around this area, mile per hour. So this is a really big factor for us. Besides that, we have different crops, different geography, and everything changed. The landscape changed, the weather changed, the sunlight changed. Um, it's completely different game to play in Israel, for example, and the Midwest, the farmers changed. Uh, some use tilt, and some in Midwest uh, they mostly stop uh, using tilt. They just keep the crops, the old crops there, and letting the um, ground do the, their magics and just sitting above the old crops. So um, everything is changed, and we need to react 
to those changes. So and this is for the first one. And the second one, I think that every tractor run that we are doing or any other way that we are uh, getting the uh, data, we try to get as much as variant as possible. So retraining our model by one or two or even I don't know, 500 images is, is not, it's not a game. It won't change a lot for, for the model. We have a lot of them. So we try to understand when few models don't agree with each other or something like that or tricks like that to understand when there is information that is interesting to rerun a train on it. So are you logging your sort of data pre-processing and data set like creation and your training runs in the in the sort of ML ops and kind of building training off of certain certain triggers or something that you that you have set up or or how does that work so one of the challenges of ML ops is reproducibility i think this is a really hard one to get right uh, you get code version and then you get dependency and well, okay, let's say you solve that with Git and Docker, but then you get data versioning. And then in all of that, you need some system that will take everything from every place you need, and then you need to push it and just click play and rerun it. So reproducibility is is really hard. And if you did like, I don't know, half a year ago, you did something good and you want to go back to that, it's really hard. So... We are trying to log as much as possible from the system perspective and from the training and the research perspective. What's nice about ClearML uh, that we are using it so not only from uh, MLOps, we are using it as a dashboard and uh, in general. So we're just pushing everything that we want to, to use as metrics and uh, show stuff there. So it's from this uh, perspective, we just log everything possible. And if it's visible, uh, uh, we can uh, use ClearML for it. But also we want to push our limits and to run faster and faster. And if we run faster, we can do even more stuff. Today we did a quid, but our mission is to spray less, grow more. So we want to do um, fungicides and uh, pesticides and fertilizer and, and etc. So we need more compute power or to be better in what we are doing and saving uh, compute power for different tasks. So we try to log everything and um, be better in what we are doing. Quick question. You mentioned retraining models. So do you have like a model per tractor or a scene? No, no, no. It's not tractor per scene, but we retrain a model like, uh, okay, there's different uh, reasons why to do it. Uh, fix, maybe we want to improve it in in different uh uh, variants of the uh, appearance of the backgrounds or uh, anything like that, or we want to make sure that we got, uh, I don't know, a new weed that we are, don't know or we are not familiar with. So instead of doing a zero shot that we are uh, kind of doing or one shot uh, that we are doing, so we can stop the system for doing this for a specific weed that became uh, more common. But in general, we are playing with, uh, with a lot of tools. We, we are trying to get in line with the best practice in, in, in the industry. And we are also experimenting. It's not just for the experiment, but it's for the research to be better. So um, in this sense, we might be uh, running the same train. Or we, if we want to may verify that we got the same result, like uh, a real research, more, not, not real, it's not academic, uh, in, you know, but uh, in this sense. Okay, well, given the fact, the law, and the, the you're you're training so many models, you're updating a lot of models. It sounds like there's a lot of like training scenarios that that you're encountering. You're kind of doing this at scale, and you've been sort of partnering with with Moses and his team to do this. I'm curious, actually, from Moses, from your perspective, sort of looking back on like the things you've been trying to enable with Clear ML. And seeing like someone use it at a larger scale like this, what are some of the things that you kind of like you thought were, were going to be important and ended up being important in terms of like the things you're tracking or the features that you've enabled? And maybe what are some things that like 
or maybe you didn't expect and now you're thinking about differently than you when you started things out? As a follow on to that, what insights are growing in your head? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to cover everything. I'll probably <laughs> forget. So just remind me. Okay, I'll start where. So I think that Alon's team were the first to say, guys, we want better connectivity with Kubernetes. And the reason I, I remember is we, we'll start this discussion. A lot of our features are actually driven by the community. And Alon his, and his team started from the open source and kind of graduated in a way. Basically, they just said, we're sick and tired of maintaining our own servers, plural. They had many. And they just said, it's not worth it. Just go do that for us. And we had multiple conversations even before. So we, we try to give a, keep a very active Slack channel and GitHub. So we actually, this is how we develop features, right? Basically, people would say, hey, I want to build something. And then it's just a crazy idea. And then we try to think about, OK, maybe we, this is doable. It, it kind of makes sense. And if it does, then we try to figure out first how to hack it so someone can you know continue with, with their day job and, and kind of build on top of it. And then try to realize, is there a way to actually structure it into the, the platform itself. And if there is, we, we try to figure out a way to actually put it in there and, and see if there's traction. And one of the things that I remember that Alan Seam were the first to do was to better connect the orchestrator with the Kubernetes cluster. Basically, the the when we started developing it, it was like, I don't know, a long time ago. Kubernetes was not a thing. So containers were, but Kubernetes was not. It, just, it was just before... Uh, Google just released Kubernetes as an open source solution before it kind of killed Docker. So we started with Docker as as kind of a bare metal. So we said, okay, fine, we'll have the orchestrator that will just pull jobs, set up the container, and then run everything inside the container. And it did that, and it's great. But the resource management or allocation of Kubernetes is terrific. So these guys came and, and they said, look, guys, we have a Kubernetes cluster. And we like the idea of your orchestrator. So basically, ClearMail orchestrator will do... Think of it as a dynamic Docker file in a way. I'm, I'm oversimplifying. Base Docker image with the ability to kind of control that kind of the Docker file you need to do in runtime, but and then also introduce some caching. Bottom line, you do not have to have like a container per job just to accelerate. Because when you streamline a process, you cannot have like every step containerized. You end up with thousands of, of containers that no one will know who is using and no one will delete because someone might be using. And basically, yeah, you get the idea. Anyhow, so they they, they said, okay, we, we love Kubernetes because it allows us to schedule resources very easily. But then when the resource is scheduled, we want this dynamic approach and obviously visibility, which is always obviously hard with Kubernetes. We also don't want our users, like the, the data scientist developers, to have actual access to the Kubernetes cluster because, well, no. <laughs> so I think that was the first time we developed the what we now call the Kubernetes glue, which basically kind of converts a job from a ClearML into a Kubernetes job basically trying to figure out whether this job can actually be executed on Kubernetes, give you kind of better visibility into the cluster itself. So users can basically push jobs into what we call a queue, which is, think of it as in Kubernetes terminology, it's basically like the a template YAML that you'll be using for that specific job, only you have a priority queue on top of it. So it kind of implicitly holds the setup itself, which is kind of resources, et cetera, but also priority on top. And then use that in order to schedule, use Kubernetes as basically your resource scheduling, which is it is terrific for, but it's, it's lacking the uh, scheduler itself, like order and priority, et cetera. This is exactly what the glue itself adds. And obviously it, it, it solves for the, the problem of uh, making sure that the end users, meaning the data scientists, will have access to the Kubernetes cluster, right? So that was a first feature that we added just because of them. And this is how we heard on, so you guys are running Kubernetes on the Edge device? And we were amazed that <laughs> someone is trying to do that. <laughs> so I feel completely obligated to throw yet another buzzword and sure. uh, just ask you about if you have an opinion. And that is... that is Don't go blockchain, Chris. <laughs> oh, I'm not, uh, well, there, that's a yet another one right there you threw out, Daniel. Hmm. Hmm. No, uh, I'm just going to stick with kind of microservice architecture when you were talking about, you know, all the containers out there and and managing that. And as people kind of are moving more and more into microservice architecture over time and segregating off all their functions and yet trying to keep them together, does ClearML as a platform have an opinion on that in any way? Or do you not care? Are you agnostic about, you know, where people end up? So if I throw the word microservices at you, what do you say? 
Okay, that's terrific. I love it. Because microservices is in Kubernetes was invented basically to manage them. But the idea behind a microservice, it's alive, it's uh, production ready, and it has to be stable. Like the default of Kubernetes is if it fails, restart it because you had a good reason to put it there. This is not what is going on with MLOps. If it's if it failed, then it'll continue failing. Like just drop it. That's the default. That's the total opposite of microservices. And that's basically our approach. Our approach is use Kubernetes for what it's good for. So you probably have another cluster doing whatever microservices that you're running, which is terrific. But for the MLOps perspective, use Kubernetes as a resource scheduler more than anything else. It's basically the opposite of the default of, of Kubernetes. And then I guess the bridge is serving models, which is actually a microservice, but you want that elasticity because you still want to be able to change it without building new Dockers all the time. You actually want that to be in-flight model upgrades, canary, etc., that you probably want to control from outside, not from an, like an ELB perspective. So this is kind of the bridge between the two, at least from our perspective. So if I'm getting sort of just like stepping back and thinking, I'm kind of trying to connect some of the things Alon you've said in terms of how things are working on your end, you, you sort of have data coming in off of the tractors, coming into various like maybe data processing jobs, which might be queued up on a queue, which runs through ClearML. That might sort of lead then into like model training jobs which I agree. So I, I love your um, illustration, Moses, about like you expect a lot of model training jobs to fail. So like Kubernetes, like spinning up a service in Kubernetes to run a training is sort of like the opposite of like a lot of what they had in mind. But anyway, so you you sort of spin up these jobs in a queue. So from the data scientist perspective, you're basically just saying, hey, I want to use this data to train a model, put it in a queue. It runs a training and finishes or not. But then like that model then, which has like a version, it's tied to the data, then sort of gets shipped out. Does it get, in your case, does it get shipped out kind of like Moses is saying to a service that's running in your like edge K3S cluster, like as a REST service for what's going on on the tractor or how does that piece work? It's a good question. I think we can see uh, two paths to start the training. One piece is f from the data as, as you spoke, and then the other piece is for the researchers who want to test the code or new experiment, new model, or et cetera, and, and want to fire a training. So when we start this, uh, let's take the example for, for the researcher. He just go in his ID and he just connect to the remote uh, workspace that is on Kubernetes that runs Kubeflow, Jupiters, and so on, and it's just playing there. And it's just click remote execute it. This runs to Moses servers and tells the uh, ClearML system to speak, to log everything. Like, okay, I want to use this container, and this is the changes I did. Like Moses says, it does, it does not create new containers for every step, so it just keeps the, the, the changes. Moses, if I'm saying something uh, wrong here, feel free to fix me. And then it goes to Moses servers. And then from there, it's going back to our servers as our agent there uh, that Moses spoke about. It is, is the glue and this start uh, and the training. So this is the training and the training continuously reports to ClearML, to the main server, what's the status and at, at the ends, what's the metrics and once we have metrics, we can decide one of the two if we are free a new version for testing on the edge or we are stopped there and just keep this track and uh, moving on. And the inference you're running on the Kubernetes cluster as a service or as like a, on the K3S as a REST service? So this is a tricky one. We have something in the box that is not in production line. When I'm saying production, like internal production, a research that we are planning to have K3S inside a pod to have a special environment for the developers that is separate, like a cluster in this cluster, something like that. But let's keep this aside. We are using, at the moment, KF serving to serve the model internal. So our metric system, just when we get a new model, we just serve it. And the metrics just being API REST service locally. And this is something like a microservice that you say. One is responsible 
entirely. It does not know anything about the metric itself. You can just probe it and to get results for each one of what you want to do. And there was another tool that is doing the metrics and it just probe the service and accumulate and then reports metrics to the ClearML service. So we have three different services. ClearML is not micro, but the other two are. And I think this is the cycle. We have a human decision in between. So we don't do the entire cycle for every model and not for every data. So I have a final question that's addressed to both of you in turn. I want to start with Alon. I'm I'm actually letting Moses cheat and hear what (laughs) Alon's answer is. Yay. (laughs) (laughs) So Moses, I'm throwing you a bone on that one. So here's the question. As you are thinking about kind of these amazing uses of technology, both from the technology creator and from the technology implementer's perspectives, and you were thinking about what's next. What are you wanting to do next? You've made it this far. You've had tremendous success, and you've got to have something that when you go to bed at night, you're going, maybe I could do that. Alon, I'd first like to hear for you as the implementer in a very specific use case, what you're thinking. And then Moses, hint, hint, now that you've heard his question, you know, you can you can answer yours as well. So Alon, I'll throw it to you first. So I have many things in, in my mind, a lot, a lot of Im- imagination before I, I go to sleep. Sometimes I see uh, bounding boxes and just seeing them and see them and see them. Sometimes I, I see different <laughs> stuff, but... Uh, Yeah, in a larger scale, I think still in green eye perspective, we can do and we are about to do the both that I I said in the industry about decision making and helping the farmer because we are already scanned the the, the, the field and we have byproduct of a lot of data and high quantity of data, high resolution data from the field. So our goal is to do both and we have lots of idea that in the pipeline to also one to get to make the decision ourselves and the other one is to help the farmer get better decision for different stuff that's not related to spray at all that was a good answer moses how about you so two things i can expose here so one we are working now this is public in, in the one of the repositories on the new version of the serving solution Basically, we're we're not a fans. We're not fans of uh, KF serving as an infrastructure, because it's very hard. Like, if you have a single model, if you're not changing it, that's fine. But if you're constantly changing them, it's 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 not easy. Adding pre-processing is not easy. Metrics, everything is hard. So together with a lot of people from the community, we redesigned the ClearML serving. So now it's internal testing, and it's very very nice. Basically, you can add the pre-processing without even code deploy it, you have it auto scale on your Kubernetes cluster. So Kubernetes does, it's basically building a serving service that is flexible and that you can change online, which is terrific. This is what we want from these type of services. So this is something that we're working on and I'm hoping that we will be able to release before the end of next month. So I think we have a talk in GTC. So before the talk, that's a deadline basically. <laughs> Uh, we will have to release it, which is that's it's always good to have a deadline. And the other thing that we're working on, and this is really research, we're, we're sort of trying to wrap our heads around how to actually solve it. And that's uh, coming directly from Alon, actually. So he was one of the guys that said, oh, I really want that. And he's not the only one. So we, we always want to make sure that we're not building for a very specific problem, that it's it's actually a widespread problem. And that problem is I have a lot of data stuck there. They're in the back end of ClearML, which basically means like multiple databases. I just want to be able to query more deeply, like create a dashboard. Like the data is there. I know I put it there. Now I ha- I want to have better interface for the database without actually accessing the database. Like this is doable, but probably kind of too risky. So we, we're trying to think how to hack together like a dashboard solution on top of it to allow you to better create better visibility for an entire process because this uh, the, the entire idea is to make this entire ML ops holistic approach. Basically means that if you have data, you should be able to use it in whatever step you're along the way of, of developing your, your product. And this is something that is a making, but will be find its way out there very soon, I'm hoping. That's awesome. I'm super excited to explore those things. I'm a fan, so pretty excited to 
hear about the serving and, and the other things coming along. And I appreciate both of you uh, being willing to kind of talk through, first of all, give us an update on what is now ClearML, which previously we talked about as Allegro and all the great things you're doing, but also in the in the context of this use case with green eyes. So I'm really impressed with what each of you are doing. And yeah, thank you both for, for joining. Thank you, thank you. All right, that is Practical AI for this week. If this is your first time listening, subscribe now at practicalai.fm or just search for Practical AI in your favorite podcast app. We're in there. And if you're a longtime listener, please do share the show with your friends. It is the best way you can help Practical AI succeed. Thanks again to Fastly for shipping our shows super fast all around the world to Breakmaster Cylinder for the Beats and to you for listening. We appreciate you. That's all for this week. We'll talk to you again next time. Thank you.